welcome to Series 2 of the Great British Quilter podcast. I'm Sarah Ashford and I can't wait to share with you my fantastic lineup of guests over the next eight episodes. I'll be meeting with authors, quilters, shop owners and industry professionals to find out more about them and how they contribute to the world of quilting that we know and love. A huge thank you goes to Orophil Thread who have generously sponsored this series and helped make it possible. Orophil is an Italian thread company specialising in superior quality cotton threads for professional and domestic quilters. With a wide range of threads in varying weights and a beautiful spectrum of colour, quilters can find the perfect thread for their project. Do visit orophil.com for more information. My second sponsor for this episode is Queen of Fabric. Queen of Fabric is a well-known Australian patchwork shop that has launched this year in the UK. Internationally known Aussie designers like Judy Newman, Margaret Sampson George, Susan Smith and Bridget Giblin, known for their creative freedom with both colour and design, are at the heart of what is on offer at Queen. Queen of Fabric carefully curates their fabric selection so you too can have all the fabric you need to help you make your very own versions of quilts designed by these inspiring Australian patchworkers. Queen of Fabric also specialises in starter kits for specific designs so the hard work of choosing the fabric is all done for you. Queen of Fabric also runs a monthly fabric club and two block of the month programmes, one for an applique quilt and the other an EPP design, both using Liberty Tana lawn fabric. These programmes are available to join at any time. Emma, the owner of Queen of Fabric, was also thrilled to launch her very own bespoke Liberty fabric range, which is now available for pre-sale on the website. To find out more, visit queenoffabric.co.uk. My guest today is Ruth Singer. Ruth is a full-time textile artist with 16 years professional experience. Ruth originally worked in museums and this background continues to infuse her work with heritage and narrative. Ruth's work is all focused on research and personal exploration of stories, often resulting in subtle, emotive, sensitive work. She makes exhibitions and commissions and creates community projects and undertakes artist residencies to explore subjects and places in detail. She has presented a number of solo exhibitions in galleries in the UK, including Narrative Threads at the National Centre for Craft and Design in 2015, in emotional repair at Gawthorpe Hall National Trust in 2018, textile traces at Lantarnum Grange Arts Centre in 2019, and criminal quilts, an arts and heritage project exploring women criminals in the 19th century, which has been touring widely since launching at the Festival of Quilts in 2018. In 2016, Ruth won the Fine Art Quilt Masters competition at the Festival of Quilts and she has been an artist in residence at many interesting and varied organisations including Staffordshire Record Office, Leicester University Department of Genetics and in a small volunteer-run library. Ruth has written three books on sewing, including the popular Fabric Manipulation in 2013 as well as Criminal Quilts book and many other smaller publications. She now runs online workshops and talks about her practice as well as professional development and mentoring for aspiring and established artists and makers. Due to the pandemic, Ruth and I caught up on Zoom for this interview, but I did have the pleasure of meeting her at her Criminal Quilts exhibition at the Festival of Quilts in 2018. It was so lovely to learn more about the story behind her work and career and I hope you enjoy listening. Hello, morning Ruth, how are you? Fine, thank you. Lovely to be here. Oh, thank you for coming to chat with me. Uh, so we're on Zoom, but uh, we're in um, tier one, tier two and tier three lockdowns. So uh, we're making the most of it. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the wonderful world of textiles that you inhabit. So how did you first become involved in textiles and in particular quilting? How did you learn to quilt? Well, I came to quilting quite late. Um, Textiles, I started off learning dressmaking as a teenager and Mm. because clothes was always my passion um, in my childhood and teens and and well into my 20s. Um, I I went to university with the intention of becoming a costume curator, a costume and textiles curator actually did 
Uh, my first degree is in medieval history, medieval studies, um, and then my second degree is in museum studies, master's degree. With, and then I went to work in the museum sector. So I kind of was, the intention was to be on kind of the other side of textiles, not in a practical making, but in um, kind of research and study. And, um, and again, that was kind of clothing focused. And then over the years working in museums, I didn't get a job as a costume curator. I worked in more an education um, sort of front of house kind of roles. And I spent three years at the V&A as adult education officer running events programs and working on exhibition teams and running talks and tours and did a lot of research into other kinds of textiles and got kind of really exploring textile techniques. So that was kind of my area of textile history that I was interested in was techniques and how, how things were made. And that got me into, um, into quilting through the Tristan quilt, which is a 14th century quilt at the v made with corded, stuffed and corded quilting. And I was really fascinated by that because I'm a medievalist anyway. So it was this kind of, you know, brought together my two passions of medieval history and textiles. Absolutely. So I wanted to learn that technique. So I actually started off, the kind of first ever kind of quilting I ever did was Trapunto or stuffed and corded quilting. And that sort of carried through um, over the last kind of 20 years of exploring researching and teaching that technique but in terms of actual patchwork quilting I did I came to that quite a lot later I probably only started that in the last eight or ten years really um I was trying to remember my first ever piece of patchwork but I think embarrassingly I think the first piece I ever properly did was for one my first book <laughs> I had to <laughs> and it was kind of it was it's a, a it's a small mention of patchwork and of quilting so I had to kind of brush up my <laughs> Yeah. Knowledge because I don't think I'd ever made any before. So I think that's probably my first one, but I have since then made various um, quilt and quilt related pieces, and paper piece patchwork is probably what I've done most of um, rather than kind of traditional quilting. I don't do a lot of the actual quilting. I like patchwork and I like corded quilting, but I don't do much actual quilting of patchwork. <laughs> just, <laughs> just to be really confusing. I'm with you. I know what you mean. And um, so a lot of your work involves using fabric that is old or damaged. And um, you've even used paper to make a beautiful patchwork hanging. So that's something a bit a bit different again. Um, so how important is it to, to you to use fabric and materials like this? But well, each, yeah. yeah, each of the, everything that I do as a textile artist, what I'm interested in is exploring a story or a narrative or a kind of a research subject that I want to talk about or talk about with my work. So I tend to pick a technique that works with the story rather than coming at technique first. Right. So I wouldn't necessarily come at, I'm making a quilt. I would be, I'm exploring a story mm-hmm. and what it turns out to be maybe a quilt. It may be an embroidery, it may be a wall hanging, maybe also I make all sorts of other things. So, um, I mean, the paper quilts came from working with, I started doing some work with paper with, I think for a school project when I was working with a school um, and it was a nice thing to do with primary schools. But the actual, the, the paper quilts that I made were actually made out of the proof copies of my first book. So I had this big stack oh. of papers. Again, it's got the story behind it. You know, that's kind of where the, that's that's why I was working in paper because I'd been kind of turning my textile knowledge into a paper-based thing. So I wanted to use those leftover papers. So it was kind of partly recycling, but also because it has it was such a big impact on me writing a book, you know, on my career and what I later did. So I wanted to kind of use that to mark that. Um, and then with textiles, I've always been in, interested in with all my work. I started off as a kind of um, product maker, making bags, cushions, uh, scarves, that kind of thing, and always with an interest in sustainable fabrics. So I did half range in um, recycled vintage fabrics and half in um, more sustainable fabrics like hemp and bamboo and organic cotton, which wasn't actually, was hard to get at that time. And so not using new fabric has always been fundamental to what I do. I don't buy very much new fabric. And so it started started off more as a kind of recycling sustainability route, but has become over the last kind of like 10 years, I suppose, much more about the narrative built in with old textiles. So old textiles have a story that's 
already embedded with them, where they've been made, where they've been used, how they've been discarded, damaged, repaired, stained, ripped, um, kind of preserved or dumped, <laughs> and all sorts of, you know, textiles have gone through all sorts of, many textiles have gone through some really hard times. I've always liked that fact old kind of textiles used to be much more valuable than they are now. They used to cost a lot more money and luxury expensive textiles would be darned and repaired and patched and remade and for, you know, for potentially for generations. So I think that kind of, that's the kind of story I'm trying to bring out by using old textiles is that there's, there's, um, there's a lot more to say. They have a kind of story of their own and also they're, they're lovely to work with. They're often, you know, washed and soft and kind of are really well worn. I actually like things with holes in. Um, I like things that I love old darns and damage. So, and I think they've got a, a story of kind of personal use and that the person who's used these, loved them, repaired them or thrown them away or whatever, you know, there's a whole complex kind of background behind that fabric. So that's why I tend to use, um, Old fabrics, but also I really find, you know, the, the quality and the things like the embroidery and the quilting of Victorian fabrics. The kind of you know you get the stitch quality, the fabric quality, and um, are actually still really they're really beautiful quality fabrics that you can't really get like really fine cotton muslin um, from the nineteenth century is just amazing, and you can't buy it like that anymore at any sensible price and. I use a lot of Victorian silks, again, that are really beautiful, soft, gorgeous fabrics that would be incredibly expensive to buy these days. But I buy old ones are much, uh, you know, because they're damaged and they're kind of fragments and I can use little tiny bits. They tend to be um, actually quite affordable. And you've really given these old fabrics new life by repurposing them, haven't you? So yeah. they get to be enjoyed again by a whole new audience. Yeah, it gives them a new interpretation. So I kind of reinterpret them. I'm kind of giving them a new story um, rather than just kind of recycling would be kind of making, you know, making making one thing into another thing. But I, you know, making an old quilt into a bag, I'm more interested in exploring the story of the old quilt through making something new rather than making functional things out of old fabrics which is what I used to do but um I kind of moved on from that mm -hmm. and the fabric colors that you work with are often very um muted and subtle and um, what is it you love about this style and have you ever used brights <laughs> yeah <work? laughs> I, I used to use a lot of bright fabrics I used to use uh, constantly hunting for recycled or old clothes that were nice and colorful I used to use a lot of wool felt old jumpers, felted mm -hmm. jumpers. But um, about 10, 12 years ago, I started making a body of work where I was using the neutral colours um, because that's what the fabric that I wanted to use was, you know. And I realised that actually that limited colour palette um, actually makes it easier for me because, you know, there was otherwise there was kind of thousands of fabrics to choose from. <laughs> how, do you, how do you settle? And it helped me create my own style that's a kind of recognisable style which as a textile artist was important and it kind of made it yeah made it easier just for me to limit what I did um and then the kind of like I bring in I do bring in work in different colors comes in here and there but so it becomes much more striking so when most of my work is neutrals or kind of washed out faded um colors a lot of browns and sepias and that a lot of it is come from particular projects so criminal quilts which I started um, in 2011 and that was using that kind of color palette and I found I really liked it and it really worked but I am actually a colorful person I do my house <laughs> colorful I have lots of color you know I like colorful clothes um, I like colorful things so and I have then I do kind of collaborative work and other projects where I get to play with my color mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of color so yeah the fabrics in my studio are mostly in that kind of neutrals or old kind of washed out range but actually I have got kind of the scrap bags full of bright colours as bright well colors. and am them. I right in thinking you've um muted you've sort of dyed brighter fabrics to make them more muted before um as well I would do occasionally use yeah do things like just over dyeing with tea um, yeah tea staining that's and of just to kind of soften them down but mm. so mostly I work I either use naturally dyed stuff that I dyed myself in kind of I like kind of eco printing so I get kind of splotchy splotchy colours <laughs> and faded kind of faded looking um, but I don't do an awful lot of dyeing these days. I don't really have the space for it. Um, 
in my studio. So mostly I'm using using what I've got, which is plenty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> don't we all have more than we could ever need? Uh-huh. Not enough hours in the day to get through yeah. it all. Um, so I was looking on your website at some of the quilts that have featured in exhibitions in the past, and um, I was particularly drawn to a quilt called Stretched. Um, and this was a patchwork that you made back in 2019. Um, it's really unusual. So I just wondered if you could tell us about it and about that particular collection of work. Yeah, the Stretched is part of a series of work I made inspired by researching historic quilts in the Quilt Association collection in Wales. And they asked me in 2017 to do put up an exhibition with them. And I decided to do extra work, doing make some new work inspired by their collections. So I made a whole series of pieces around, kind of inspired by quilts. Um, and then Stretch came later because I hadn't, didn't get it finished in time for that exhibition, which is the story of my life. Um, it becomes another project. But um, the whole collection was looking at quilts from... I was really interested in the quilts in the collection that were not perfect and that were damaged and um, out of shape or stained. I mean, they've got beautiful old quilts there that have been used as horse blankets and paint dust sheets and all sorts and are really, really battered. And I love those because they have that kind of the story that I'm interested in. But also with a lot of those quilts was um, the actual story of how they had, what, what, what had happened to them. So who had, who'd made them, who'd owned them, um, why they'd made them. So a lot of them were things like people who made them to sell. So some of them were made for purely for warmth um, out of materials that were available. Some were made as a commercial product and, and sold and that enabled um, the makers to keep a roof over their heads. So I was kind of interested in the connection between quilts and uh, keeping warm and bodies and quilts and kind of housing and home and comfort and security in the, all those different ways, whether you're making the quilt to sleep under or you're making the quilt to sell to pay for your other um, essentials. So stretched was an idea I had this idea of looking, there was a quilt in the collection that had um, been very well loved and had kind of gone out of shape so that the patchwork had kind of drooped and um, it it was kind of, yeah, it kind of had that feeling of like an old teddy bear that had been sort of loved, loved to death and it was kind of slightly misshapen. And I but it had a story of still being, you know, have been used for generations, have been passed down a family. And kind of, I really liked that idea of um, the quilt protecting a body. And that kind of made me think of bodies and particularly women's bodies aging and how like textiles, we go out of shape and stretch and change. <laughs> and that that is something that actually we should be proud of and that celebrate and not, you know, and it's seen as a, a thing we're ashamed of that our, our, our bodies have changed um, and they stretch. So I wanted to create a quilt using fleshy toned fabrics. Um, again, things out of my stash. Um, and each of the blocks, so there's a kind of, they're kind of standard blocks, I think about 10 centimetre squares, but the the front fabric is bigger than the square. So it's kind of each piece kind of overlaps and sort of flows off the front of the quilt. And then it's they've all got weights inside, so the little lead weights all through it, which kind of hold the weight and kind of, create this kind of droop um and I think that kind of connection between um kind of you know how we we kind of revere old textiles but we don't revere old bodies and I think there's there's an awful lot of different ways of interpreting that about um how how we as women you know we're, we're looking at perfection in our quilts you know as quilt making and there's a lot of attention on the kind of the perfection of the stitches and the matching of the seams and actually you know and we kind of apply that to our own bodies quite a lot of time and actually most of us aren't like that and there's no reason why we should be and you know all these things um all bodies are beautiful and kind of so there are old quilts and things that are kind of damaged and um out of uh, no longer perfect as they were made so I think it's kind of an expression of those kind of kind of stories it's a real divisive quilt that one I think some people (laughs) some people get it and some people just I did get I did get a message once saying why did I want to make a quilt that looked like it'd been made out of uh, out of shape underwear. 
<laughs> oh, I didn't think that. I but thought it's that it looked more like different shades of skin, mm. different skin tones. I think yes. perhaps that's what you were alluding to yeah, rather than absolutely. underwear. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it was a bizarre thing to comment. You know, it was an unhelpful kind of comment, but it was an interesting <laughs> perspective that she couldn't see why on earth I would want to make a thing that basically she saw as ugly. But, you know, the whole point is it makes people react. You know, if I'm working as a textile artist, that kind of the, the point is to make people think, and that's what I want. And if it's made people think and unwelcome thoughts, that's still interesting. But, um, yeah, it's definitely been a, a, a more divisive one. Um, I made other quilts in that kind of series that are um, kind of very much inspired by quilts. So I made a piece called Quilt Blocks, which is literally wooden blocks wrapped in an old quilt that you can use when they've been in the gallery you could use them to kind of build a um build a kind of brick wall that was what I imagined with these kind of using when people were making quilts to sell in order to um you know pay the rent that then then the kind of the quilt became part of the house in effect so it's kind of like the idea with that piece so that it was a kind of idea I love that yeah one. it was a, a process in exploring the meanings of quilts rather than and the, and the way quilts have been used in the past rather than kind of reproducing quilts so that's how I tend to work with kind of historic material of kind of using the ideas rather than the, the straightforward I always look for the the weirder more difficult complicated story in anything that I'm exploring you know there's the straightforward route which would be you know make a quilt inspired by the colors or the or the or the technique or the patchwork whereas I go in the kind of like oh I must find a more awkward route into this and that's what keeps it interesting for me yeah I'm absolutely and it's, it's, it's very me. creative and different isn't it because like you say so many people just sort of do a modern reinterpretation of a mm. quilt or something but which is lovely you know I, I don't you know I, I, I really enjoy those um but it's you know I'm I'm not very good at making the same thing repeatedly so making an entire quilt of the same block as well I would I would run out of patience, I think, as well. Um, so, yeah, it's quite kind of keeps what keeps my interest, um, keeps me kind of in, feeling inspired. And it's something different, isn't it, for people to see as well? You know, I think it's it's really, really interesting. And I did love that quilt blocks. What we'll do is we'll put a, a link to your website where people right. can view all of these quilts and see what we're actually Yes, because they don't really make sense. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I first came across your work and you at the Festival of Quilts when I saw your Criminal Quilts exhibition a few years ago. Um, and I watched the video on your website, which was really, fascinating actually to have seen the exhibition first and then retrospectively watch the process and the work that went into it so uh, can you tell the listeners a little bit about criminal quilts yeah criminal quilts was originally the first ever work I did based on well the whole project is based on photographs of women prisoners from Stafford prison which are now held in the Staffordshire record office from uh, 1877 to 1916 so they're Victorian and Edwardian photographs black and white and sepia photos. And I was originally commissioned to do a piece of work about the building, which was the, the courtroom where these were photos um, were on display. And I was supposed to be looking at the building, but the photographs kept drawing me in. And I said, can I, you know, can I make a piece of work based on these photos instead? Because they're just amazing. And they were really happy with that. So I made um, a small group of miniature quilts um, inspired by these early sepia photographs, 1880s, Photographs and they're of women prisoners. Well, there's men as well, but I chose to work with the photos of women and they have their hands on their chests, which is really, really weird and quite haunting. It turns out that that's done in case that was done as part of the photographic process in case there were missing fingers or had injuries to the hands that would be then used as identification. So, photography was used to kind of as a development of written descriptions of people to help identify people if they re offended. So I made a whole series, a uh, small series of works using the hands as a motif within miniature quilts. I made a series of six of them, each named after some of the women in the photographs. So kind of reflecting their, a bit about their story or a bit about their life using details from their clothing and the textiles that they're wearing. Um, and then kind of the building the, with the idea that I was, by creating quilts, I was adding some kind of softness and comfort back to their lives, which they were not experiencing mm. um, in their lives in prison or probably out of prison either. So that's where it started. I made those pieces. The museum 
purchased them. And um, so then I'd done this really interesting project and had nothing to show for it because I'd sold the work, which was great. But also <laughs> I kind of wanted to carry on exploring it. So I got permission from them to continue with it. And I made a whole another series of work uh, of miniature quilts and um, and then gradually developed that project over a number of years, sort of slowly developed. And I had I made some bigger pieces for my first solo exhibition in 2015, which was called Narrative Threads. And that included some pieces from Criminal Quilts, that series, alongside other groups of work. And kind of then it sort of took off from there because one of those pieces was um, a large embroidered hanging piece, which I then entered into the Festival of Quilts Fine Art Quilt Masters in 2016. And much to my surprise, won. Um, and that has kind of, that gave the whole project a massive push because mm. that gave me the impetus to then apply for further funding. So I had Arts Council funding, where I still have Arts Council funding, to develop the project, to work with communities, to tour the exhibition, create new work, work in collaboration, do all sorts of interesting things. And so that that has then grown and grown and grown. So that its first outing as a kind of exhibition on its own was 2018 Festival of Quilts. Um, and I wrote a book alongside it, exploring the research, um, because the research became as much of the project as the textiles did. The kind of research really became huge. So I worked with volunteers. We did um, research on all the photographs of women in the collection, which was over 500 photos right through from 1877 to 1916. Um, I did a lot of research on prison clothing and prison experiences of women in that period. A lot of the volunteers did research about some of the individuals about their lives and did whole biographies of them. So it was a massive amount of research. Huge project kind of crammed into quite a short space of time. Um, And that turned into the Criminal Quilts exhibition. So I included some of the previous work I'd made and then a whole series of new pieces. At Festival of Quilts, and then that exhibition has then toured. Well, it was touring until this year, until things got complicated this year. Um, <laughs> but it will continue, um, continue to tour. So it kind of launched at Festival of Quilts, and then has travelled around. So it goes. To, it's been to universities, museums, as well as art galleries and textile spaces. So I think it's a real interesting crossover between disciplines. So I have a lot of. I've worked a lot with academics, criminologists. Um, Textile people, obviously, people who are interested in family history. I thought it was only going to be of interest to people in Staffordshire because it's it's all women from Staffordshire and I thought it was a very local project. But it turns out I was totally <laughs> misguided in that and it's been kind of nationally and internationally. Um, it's really intrigued people, which has been great because it's kind of taken a life of its own and kind of grown as this whole project. And it's only actually kind of a small part of what I do, but it's become a really big, big deal. So I've now reprinted the book into a second edition and created some new work and I've got more new work in progress. So that's so continuing and you're continuing yeah. to add add to that body of work. Yeah, yeah, it keeps growing. And um, so each exhibition is slightly different and um, by the time it goes back on display, which will be a while yet, it's just come back to me last week for it's been in uh, Dorchester. And then by the time it goes back out next year, there'll be some completely new work in there as well, wow. which keeps it exciting for me. But at the moment, Can I'm working on that. Can you tell us about room. that new work? Yeah, well, I, one of the new pieces that was in the, the most recent show, well, again, they're not quilts, you see. <laughs> they're slightly off topic when I'm calling it the still called criminal <laughs> quilts, but the new work mostly isn't quilts. Um, it's the new work I've worked with the jeweller called Alice Power, and we've made a series of little miniature boxes that are based on prison cells and the shape, uh, the, the kind of... Um, proportions of a Victorian prison cell and then each of those tells a story of either one individual or a kind of collective story so there's one about literacy there's one about laundresses because a lot of them worked as laundresses there's a lot about industry um, women worked in um, the one about homelessness so there's all kind of little stories told with these little miniature boxes combining metal and textile and wood and found objects uh, which has been wow. really, really good, but That's a really fantastic. lovely project. Um, they will go be online soon. <laughs> I haven't got them online yet. So I will get photos of those up soon. And then I'm working on two other collaborations with um, visual artists. So I've got some portrait. I've w- been working with a contemporary portrait painter who does really kind of colourful graffiti style portraits. So he's done some paintings based on the photographs. And then I'm going to do some work with those, either stitching into the original portraits or digital print and working into them and 
making some patchwork. So there's some really bright colours coming in there. Oh. There will be some amazingly bright colours. Um, that's a lot of fun because they're, I haven't, haven't quite had kind of, haven't really got into it yet because I need to kind of get all my colourful stash out and start playing with those. Um, and then I'm doing another project with a fine artist called Gillian McFarland, who I've worked with a lot. We've done a lot of projects together. And that is much more kind of installation narrative based work so I'm being really vague because I don't know exactly what it's going to look like yet <laughs> but we keep working on ideas I've got some little Staffordshire figurines um, of kind of Victorian figurines of kind of idealized womanhood so got, got uh, Florence Nightingale and um, Red Riding Hood I'm looking at them they're just up on my shelf <laughs> and they're, they're, I'm kind of using those that kind of and then we're looking at the kind of labelling of how women are labelled, the kind of words that are used to describe these Victorian women and um, women who are in the criminal justice system now and kind of how they react. So I don't know quite know what that's physically going to turn into yet, but <laughs> it's definitely Sounds interesting. Sounds exciting. And I'm working on new quilts, new, more quilt-ish quilts for, um, for the next version of the show as well. So kind of exploring. I'm using a lot more digital print. I've been doing a lot of digital print within the last couple of years with this. So I use a lot of digital prints and photographs to make the quilts. And I've just sent off a whole load of fabric to print with some of my digital designs on it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting that it keeps, it keeps growing, mm, it keeps developing, um, which is really, really keeps it interesting. Yeah. And that leads me on nicely to my next question, actually, because you do a lot of hand stitching over these images that you've had mm. digitally printed and you, yeah. do, you do a lot of hand stitching. Um, so that's obviously something that you enjoy. Um, it takes many hours to do it. So how do you remain patient and motivated and to keep going to create these beautiful stitches? Yeah, it's an interesting question because I often get asked, you know, you know, we say you must be so patient to do all that stitching. And I am patient with sewing. I'm not very patient with anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because I enjoy it. I kind of see it like reading a reading a really long novel. It's that you want to, you, you know, you, you're, in, you're into the, the story. You want to keep going. Um, so that's kind of, and it's not, it's not a chore to read a book that you're enjoying mm-hmm. um, or to watch, you know, an entire series <laughs> of a programme, you know, because if you're into it, it's... It's it's great. It doesn't it become a chore. So I don't find it um, a chore. I really really enjoy it. I tend to listen to a lot of radio programs and audio books mm-hmm. and things. Well, like, once I've got up and running, I have to have silence while I'm thinking through the process. Yes. Once I kind of know what I'm doing and I've started stitching, I will just stitch along to um, kind of all kinds of podcasts and um, and radio programs and audio books. But um, yeah, I, I think I do like getting to the end of it, but I think it's the process and it's the process is really part of the work. So the reason I choose to use slow techniques is particularly with criminal quilts, because a lot of that is about length of time of prison yeah. sentences and um, and prison labour and women doing needlework in prison and, and you know, and sort of so the one of the pieces I made for the, the kind of middle round of criminal quilts is a hand paper piece patchwork with about a thousand hexagons of yeah. about you know one inch hexagons made I out of Victorian mostly that. Victorian fabrics and it took ages I mean I was doing it on and off over about nine months probably it did take a very very long time but and I made it long and thin as a kind of linear thing so it wasn't it's not a quilt and it's not um it's because that was about length of prison sentence and kind of like numbers of days and that kind of act of slow stitching is becomes part of the work that it wouldn't absolutely the story wouldn't be as complex if I'd made it by machine. Not You're almost stitching it. the story into it, aren't exactly. you? Exactly. Well. Yeah, exactly. Very, That's very exactly good. it. Yeah. And you even embroidered over those um, hexagons, I think, didn't yes, you? Yes, it's not, it's not, I, I do sort of surface decoration on them. So there's various tiny objects attached and hand shaped silhouettes embroidered over the top. So they kind of disappear into it, really, which, again, I think is part of the story that you kind of can't always see the full story of these women. You only see a kind of a fragment of it. And that's why um, with a lot of criminal quilts, there's a lot of layering and covering up and revealing. And that's all to do with kind of the research process and also kind of what we know about these women. All we know about them is their prison record. We don't have their real lives. So there's all those kind of complexities. And every time I look at things, I can come up with kind of new interpretations about the stories and how my work kind of because other people see different things in it I see different things in it all the time and that's what keeps it interesting to me to kind of going back and then I can keep exploring go back to kind of exploring some of those ideas and new work and kind of keep drawing out those themes 
Fantastic. And uh, so moving on to um, 2020, uh, what a year it's been, uh, but you've been very busy and you've been um, working with Gawthorpe Textiles and uh, the textile, Textiles in Lockdown project. Yeah. Uh, so I'm fascinated to hear more about that. Yeah, that was, I mean, really um, wonderful project concept that Gawthorpe Textiles Collection, which is a textile museum, small textile museum in Lancashire, based in a National Trust house. So it was developed, a collection developed by the the last kind of family owner of the house, um, Rachel K. Shuttleworth. And she created this textile collection with the idea of teaching techniques and sharing textile, the love of textiles. And that has become the Gawthorpe Textiles Collection, it's a museum collection. And I coincidentally have worked a lot with them in the last few years. I've done quite a lot of research there, their pincushions collection, and their corded quilting, which I'm hopefully going to be doing a bit more research and publishing um, about that. And then in 2018, I showed my exhibition, Emotional Repair, at the museum and used their collections to go and create a whole new body of work. So I kind of know the collection and the museum really well, but it was total coincidence that I, they, I applied for the Textiles in Lockdown project um, and was lucky enough to get it. So their concept was to create a, a digital resource, so something for kind of posterity that collected and marked the, what people were doing, what textile makers were doing during lockdown. So they, this was advertised in maybe June. So we were kind of coming to the end of first lockdown at that point, uh, not for me and Lester, but um, everywhere else. <laughs> and um, so kind of looking back at what people had been doing kind of March, April, May, June kind of time, and creating a digital resource from that. So what I proposed was to do an e well, I proposed to do a podcast talking to people about what they'd made and a small ebook to go with it with some photographs. And that turned into an enormous ebook, <laughs> <laughs> which is, is a hundred page ebook in the end, um, and the podcast. And because the stories were just so it's so much material, I had so I created um surveys online surveys for people to share their stories asking kind of trying to ask pertinent questions that kind of drew out how people had responded how what about their creativity not just kind of what did you make um it was very much about kind of why did you make what 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 benefits were you getting from making how did it support your well-being during this yeah. time or if you weren't able to make you know how has that impacted on you because I knew from my own experience and talking to um other textile artists friends a lot of people had struggled with making I think particularly the professionals have kind of really struggled with the kind of well what's the point I've got no exhibitions there's nowhere to sell it yeah it all feels a bit pointless to produce more things and creativity their creativity really suffered and I really found that I really struggled I um, think that particularly at the beginning of lockdown there was so much distraction with you know watching the news and wondering mm -hmm. what was going on in the world and suddenly we were all locked down it's very yeah. hard to be in that creative mindset yeah, when you're when it's kind of fight or flight survival yeah. mode at that yeah. point isn't it um yeah. so yeah I, I, the same as you I've heard repeatedly lots of people including uh, Tracy Chevalier the author she mm. was um mm. my first podcast guest for this series and she was saying as well you know it's very hard even though we are we do it I you know I do it as a career and I'm creating all of the time but suddenly to keep that focus when so much else was going on to start with was was really very difficult mm. yeah and I think that's a lot of people said that but for everyone who said that there were other people who had an amazing I think everybody struggled in the first few weeks but a lot of people got into the flow and I think where pe the people who really flourished creatively were people who had previously not had enough time to do it yes so it was it, mostly for people who for whom it's a hobby and now they're not commuting or they're even if they're on furloughed or they're not working or they aren't going to the places you know they aren't using up their time on other things and they were able to just focus on making and for some people that was making scrubs and um, was making other things that you know kind of um for charity and donation to supporting other people and some people are actually having time to explore their own interests, learn new techniques, really delve in because they were just kind of keeping their sewing out all the time instead of putting it away yes. and only doing it occasionally. So there's a real vast range of experiences of people who um, kind of made lots and lots and people who hardly made a thing and really missed it. And I think what, and what 
found I found most interesting doing the research and talking to people was the kind of the collective projects and the groups. So that's what I then focused on for the podcast was talking to people who'd run group projects. So that was a mixture of people who'd run, who had projects up and running and they kind of continued them online or created projects that allows people to come together online and, um, and share their stories. People who um, came up with ideas for people to make individual blocks for quilts or individual pieces that then got built into, sewn into larger pieces and that kind of process of bringing people together remotely was really, really impactful. And I think a lot of people found that so useful to be able to engage with a textile project, give me something to do, something to concentrate on, got a deadline, got a focus. And for some people was able to kind of express their emotions and their anxieties through textile in a way that, um, that they felt was kind of, you know, it was beneficial to them and it was part of a bigger thing. And that was really, really powerful. So those stories, you know, and they, most of those, that kind of work is in the kind of quilt form. You know, that's how it's ended up as being kind of mostly it's, it's quilt based, which is really lovely. And that's what I think is so powerful and impactful about the textile world and the quilting world in particular is that combining of individuals work into a larger piece. And that's got so many kind of deeper meanings to it. And I think that's, that's just it's amazing. And I think textiles is a really unique in that aspect because you don't get ceramicists doing that. You know, you don't, um, you don't really get writers doing that. You know, it's not, it's not the way other people work, but in textiles, it makes perfect sense to us to come together and to kind of make things small pieces and building them together. And that kind of like, and a quilt made of lots of people's stories is amazingly emotionally impactful in so many different ways so that was a real joy to be able to delve into those stories and really think about how important textile making is in a much broader scale not just for each individual making them feel better having a bit of escape time but about being part of something and that's that's a kind of like the legacy of that project has been able to kind of capture that that story and And that you know in 30 40 100 years time people will be able to look back and go gosh you know the the power of textiles to bring people together in that time particularly when we physically can't be together and that's Um, that's yeah when people are used to being together and sharing their textile making a lot of the time you know an awful lot of textile makers work in in groups in one way or another um or go to events you know we go to the festival of quilts and to see and touch and you know and interact and without that it's but i think it's still you know the textile world has still managed to maintain quite a lot of that that community feeling through um, the kind of projects and um, connections that people have, which is just amazing. I think it's great that we've been able to use technology to innovate and still remain connected in this way when we are all all at home. And like you say, the um, the quilts that people make collectively with the stories attached to them, they are becoming so much more valuable because they were made in isolation, but yet they've now been brought together. Yeah. And it is going to be a wonderful reflection of, of lockdown. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's great. And how have you personally remained inspired and motivated throughout lockdown? Obviously, you've been very busy. So uh, that's been been a wonderful thing, I imagine, for you. Yeah, it's been a funny thing for me because I haven't been kind of textile creative very much I haven't made an awful lot but I had actually planned this year to be not making an awful lot so I've you know I've had two solo exhibitions in in two years so I well three solo exhibitions in three years so I've done a lot of making mm-hmm. this year was a uh, touring exhibitions rather than making new much new work and then getting on with some other things like writing writing a new book which I've got halfway through <laughs> I'm getting there um and that was kind of that became my lockdown project for the first half of lockdown and then I'm working on artist development projects so I do on a kind of like my freelance consultancy kind of work has kept going and that's been really good because I've been working with other artists and professional artists and my colleagues so I've had kind of you know regular contact with other people which has been really really good because um but whereas textile base, I haven't done a lot. I did finish um, a quilt that I started for myself about eight years ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you I forgot it. Really? I know it's mostly audio for everybody else, but you have to describe. You know, actually, finish. I, st- I cut all the fabrics out. It's various scraps of clothing and bits of um, you know all sorts of bits and pieces um, in my kind of 
my kind of neutral colour palette with a little bit of purple there's and some, I can see some brights in there <laughs> yeah there's, it's coming out a bit brighter on camera than I think it really is but uh, yeah there's a bit of pink and purple which is um I cut it all out probably eight years ago when I decorated my living room and I went right I make a quilt that matches the colours in my living room yes and um got them cut out and never did anything more. and they never got any further because work always comes first mm-hmm. before my own making um and then I kind of run out of steam for it. don't want to spend any more time sewing when I've been doing eight hours solid hand stitching for four days to finish an exhibition <laughs> piece. So I did get that finished um, in lockdown. I finally finished the piecing and properly backed um, that. So I did actually get, a, and then I thought, right, I, you know, that's kind of got me into the flow. And actually I haven't, I don't think I've done much since. And that was probably done by June. Um, so yeah, it's an odd thing. I, and I've, it's because I'm not in the middle of a body of my own work, I kind of didn't have anything to kind of carry on with. I'm working on some criminal quilts pieces and they're kind of ticking over and I have been stitching on a, um, another digital print quilt, um, which is now the stitching is now finished and I've now got to quilt it. But because I wasn't kind of in the middle of stuff, I had to kind of have the thought process, which is always the longest bit for my work is the kind of the thought process, the research, and then the kind of trying things out and seeing what works before I'm actually kind of get up and running. And that can take ages at the best of times. Yes because it's a slow process um and I've been in that slow process for the last few months and kind of just getting to the point where I'm starting to make things um and when my computer broke a couple of weeks ago <laughs> suddenly found it was much easier to concentrate on my, <laughs> on my making because I didn't really have um I didn't have the distraction of being able to kind of get on you know I can't carry on writing my book because I can't do it so you know that was that was actually quite good for me and got kind of kick-started a few things um so, yeah, I think my motivation has mostly been coming around working with other people at the moment. And that's what I've been trying to do, you know, trying to have conversations and doing things like this is great. Kind of that conversations really inspire me talking to other creative people and um, thinking about, you know, why we do what we do. I find really, um, yeah, really motivating. But I did have a conversation yesterday with my the, the group that I, of um, artists and makers that I support about how we kind of inspire our own creativity because everybody's very focused on making stuff for Christmas and selling. It's all about kind of, you know, for professional makers, it's all about selling at the moment and there's not really much time left for coming up with new ideas. No. We had an interesting conversation about that last night, about how how we do that when we can't do the things we would normally do because, you know, I would normally go and hang out in other people's studios and talk to my friends, you know, who artist friends, maybe do, you know, go on a workshop, that kind of thing to kind of kickstart some ideas, go to a museum. That's always my top of my list. starting point, yeah, absolutely. Um, That's how I come up with a lot of my ideas are from museum visiting. So kind of trying to come up with some ways of kind of creating some of that without being able to do all those things. Um, So I'm going to, I've got some books off the shelves and kind of exhibition catalogues and I'm going to spend some time with those like I was going to a museum and with them to kind of, kind of stimulate some new, some new ideas and then having more conversations with other people about it. And the more you kind of talking, talking it through helps kind of. I think that's the beauty of actually going to a museum. It's so much more of an immersive experience, isn't it? When you can see something in 3D Mm. and you can possibly touch it, certainly get up close to it. Mm. You can read about it. You can talk to the curators. You can discuss it with your friend that you're with. Yeah. And when you have to do that from home, suddenly it's, it's, it's not quite the same. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it's an interesting challenge the kind of the way that I work, that I, all my research inspiration I hadn't really realised it mostly comes from outside. It's not it's not sort of coming necessarily from in my studio. But I've got tons of old sketchbooks that I can go back through and look through old ideas. And I, there's, there's plenty there that I could be working on. But um, but without an exhibition date, I find it quite hard to focus on getting stuff from the thinking process into the finished product, yes. finished work. So as exhibitions keep getting pushed back and pushed back, you know, kind of my enthusiasm to, to bring it to the forefront but then when I start it I love it you know once I start sewing I do it for weeks you know quite happily ignore everything else but, <laughs> um, getting into the flow really is the challenge so have you got a favorite piece that you've worked on to date is it um, something that you've exhibited or maybe something more personal I think actually it's interesting most pretty much everything I've made in the last five years I have exhibited because I looked at the um Looking at the Fine Art Quilt Masters, or whatever it's called now, Textart, I can't remember what it's called now. 
I, I know it's something different. Quilt masters, textile art masters, you know, yeah, art textile masters. Something I looked at that at the beginning of this year and thinking, what can I enter in that? And it has to be something that hasn't been exhibited in the last two years. And I hadn't got anything new that I hadn't exhibited because I've done so many solo exhibitions that everything I've made has been for an exhibition or it's a gift and it's gone um, or a private commission. And to which I can't, couldn't <laughs> then ask for back. So I hadn't actually got anything new, new. So yeah, everything that, um, that I've made recently has been, yeah. So my favorite, th- I suppose my f- favorite thing in some ways is the, the criminal courts hanging that won the Fine Art Quilt Masters Prize because that has had such an impact on the work that I've done in my career and my profile in, t- in the quilting world, particularly that has had, that's kind of like, probably my, you know my most well-known piece and it's mm-hmm. been seen by way more people than anything else I've ever made because it's been at the festival of quilts twice it's been at all the knitting and stitching shows and loads of other exhibitions so it's been seen by thousands which and at the most- time you had no idea that it was going to have that reaction no exactly I made it I didn't even make it for the competition I made it it was made already um so it was a really kind of, it's, yeah, that, so that's had a real impact. But actually my personal favourite probably is my Memorials Pincushions project, which has again been in a couple of exhibitions, um, which is a series of 47 handmade pincushions in memory of my auntie who died at 47. So there's one representing every year of her life. And it was something, again, that took a long time, the thought process of working out, I wanted to make something with 47 pieces. And eventually that kind of came to, um, turned into pin cushions because um, she was interested in textiles. She loved textiles and that kind of inspired my love of textiles. And it took me years to get actually finish them all. So the first exhibition, there were only half of them. But because I've been able to use lots of different techniques, antique textiles, lots of different materials. And so each one is really different. And I think that creatively was really great because I got to do tiny little experiments of different techniques. So complex embroidery, but on a really tiny scale. So they're manageable. So it personally, it's a really impactful project and, um, you know, it's, I'm really proud to have done that and really happy with the work that I produced. It's had, you know, my, my family really appreciate it as well. Mm, um, really special. and creatively it was a really enjoyable way of working. So and it's, you know, and it, it does matter to me that it's been seen because most of my work I do make for the purposes of it being exhibited. So the fact that it's been exhibited in a museum as well, it's been at Gawthorpe and various other galleries is kind of, is great. You know, we were saying when it was up at Gawthorpe, it was the National Trust House, you know, my auntie would have been so proud of that to have something about her in a museum context like that would have been. And made perfect. by you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the other piece that um, that kind of, I'm <laughs> coming up with three favourites now, um, is also related to Gawthorpe, which is a memorial piece that I made during the exhibition that I had there a couple of years ago. I collected names and dates of people um, whose loved ones had died and I stitched those into a memorial sampler um, and there were over 100 names and dates in there. And again, really, really personal and emotive and quite harrowing, a lot of it, but really... Um, really powerful to be able to do that so that people you know trusted me to ha- give me their names and dates of um you know their families members and their friends who died and told me quite amazing personal stories but that was you know it was it was, it was a very emotional project to create it and then that piece was then purchased by Gawthorp Textiles so that's in the museum collection so that I think is the perf I couldn't have imagined a better place for it really mm-hmm. but those stories are now collected at Gawth- they were collected at Gawthorpe as part of that project and now they're in that kind of museum collection forever. So having things in museum collections is something that makes me really proud and really happy. And that, that particular piece is in a museum, I think is is just perfect. It's kind of where it, it's just right. That's kind of, I didn't wasn't making it for that purpose, but it is absolutely the right, um, nice, right outcome for it. So oh, that's, that's lovely. really nice. Oh, that's really lovely. And so, oh, excuse me. Um, so for looking to 2021, you're um, running some workshops online. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got the Scrap Patchwork Workshop coming up in uh, February. Uh, why did you feel it was important to run something like this at this time? Well, it's, I've kind of, I've been thinking about doing online workshops for, you know, probably eight or 10 years and not quite getting around to it. And then, um, at the beginning of the lockdown, I had to kind of convert an in-person workshop very rapidly into an online workshop. 
and didn't many people yeah, it wasn't probably wasn't the slickest thing I've ever done but actually it was okay and people really loved it and so I wanted to repeat that so I did that again in October uh, November um, criminal courts workshop which was amazing and um, it was so lovely to have people from all over the world be able to be part of the work that I was doing because that normally can't isn't possible when it's in person and um and because the criminal quilts, you know, the story, it was all about the stories um, of the women in the photographs. So that was kind of really, um, it was great to have those conversations with people. And then I wanted to kind of take some more, do, but then I decided I'd want to do something a little bit less intense. So the scrap patchwork is, has got a little bit of story behind it, but it's not as quite as complex and um, story driven as, um, as a criminal quilts project. But that's using, look, just the te- looking at the technique that I use for using up my tiny scraps. And I started doing that using leftovers from um, previous projects, so tiny little scraps and kind of my kind of the self philosophy of using what I've got, making use of tiny bits, but also using some of my antique textiles that are in these tiny little fragments that are kind of exploring those little tiny precious things and making making something out of those and it's a very slow meditative process which is all about you know that's kind of what pretty much everything that I do is all about kind of thinking through making and taking time over um and stitching the stories of those scraps in so yeah that's running in February and I've got um one in January that's looking at precious objects which is using um gain tiny treasures from collections so little 3d objects broken jewelry on antique scraps and kind of creating a personal piece so it's very much about using personal story some kind of story so all of my workshops are based around kind of using those stories and something with a kind of a narrative to it so and that's what I really enjoy sharing that because everybody brings their own interpretation and their own stories to it and it's that's where I always have a live element in the workshop so people can share those stories with each other and um, get inspiration from each other because that's the bit I miss about teaching in person is kind of you know you go around the room and see what people are making and you go oh this is really interesting what have you brought in from home and you know why have you chosen that color palette and where are these really nice fabric scraps from and where did you you know and those kind of um, sparking of ideas from each other and sort of trying to find a way of doing that in online workshops is something that I'm exploring because I think you know that's the bit that I'm, I'm really missing. And I think that's what people really value, isn't it? Having that personal connection with you and with each other and with the things that they're making. So to try and recreate that as best you can on Zoom is really valuable for people. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I think people really, clearly really enjoy getting to nosy around in my studio as well. So I try and just tidy up corners. and Everyone them. likes to have a little nosy. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking There's behind you now. What have you got on that There's show? <laughs> it's full of old and weird and dusty things yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh and finally I like to end the podcast with two top tips from um the guest that I'm speaking to so I was just wondering um what tips you would like to share with the listeners today mm-hmm. um I think my first tip is probably I've talked about a lot it's kind of like using what you have um and using fabrics that are there not just because they're there but perhaps for the kind of the stories that they they can hold so leftovers from other quilts that you've made so that you kind of little scraps left they all have a little story they'll all spark a memory um and using and there's you know some of that's about sustainability and not buying new and I know that that's come out over this year when people weren't able to go fabric shopping and people were using what was in their stash but for me it's all about kind of um seeing what you've got and what stories it can tell. And, you know, everything from, I know a lot of people use, you know, they use old shirts or they use baby clothes, children's clothes, and they all have a story. But even going further back than that, you know, I'm like your grandma's um, threadbare tea towel actually may not be the most exciting piece of fabric, but it actually has really, really powerful stories and memories. And I think that's what I'd always encourage people to use is to kind of, to look at the fabrics that they might overlook um, and the cloth that's kind of got all sorts of um, more depth to it and um, explore those kind of use that if, even as part of the work just to kind of bring in those those kind of stories and that kind of ties into my my second tip which I was thinking about which was about kind of looking at those stories behind what you're making and um, kind of exploring the deeper narrative so you know for example people a lot of people have been making pieces for charity, making things as um, for donations and kind of um, supporting causes, which is great. It's a fantastic way of using using making skills. But I kind of encourage people to look at 
the deeper stories behind why those issues are issues and why people are why those charities are needing to fundraise and kind of perhaps exploring some of those the personal stories and the kind of the reasons which is what kind of drives me is the kind of the story behind the obvious story um and I think that can be really interesting and that's what comes out with people making kind of the collaborative quilts during lockdown and kind of looking at that some people you know really focused on the personal and some people focused on the collective um stories and um projects around refugees and things like that there's always such a lot of interesting complex stories and we can shy away from them sometimes and kind of find them a bit difficult but I think they're creatively really rich and deep vein to kind of explore and it's important for us to and if we can share those our thinking through our textile making and kind of encourage people to think and explore and understand other people's lives and I think that can be done so effectively through textiles because textiles are so that universality and the, everybody wears everybody wears cloth, you know, there's no way around yeah. it. You know, everybody, everybody has that universal experience. And I think that's, um, I think textiles in whatever kind of making has the potential to have real kind of impact and really tell stories. So that's what I kind of encourage people to do, whatever they're, whatever it is that they're making. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Well, thank you so much, Ruth. It's been fascinating talking to you. I really, well. really enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you so much to my sponsors, Orophil Thread and Queen of Fabrics, for helping make this podcast possible. Do visit the brand new website www.greatbritishquilter.com and sign up to the newsletter to keep up to date with all the latest news. And don't forget you can join the community in the Great British Quilter Facebook group. Thank you for listening.